Did you try to steal an election? No. This out. How easy is it to steal an election? It's a fairly easy thing to do. The battle over ballots. We've seen an uptick in voter fraud in the last several years. Election fraud. I did not sign for Barack Obama. So someone forged this. That's correct. Brazen scheme. So you didn't write that? I did not. Ugly charges. You talk about Jim Crow. Is voter ID similar? Absolutely. Even to murder, even to lynchings. What's at stake for America? Do you think there was voter fraud in the 2008 Senate race? I don't think there's voter fraud. I know there was voter fraud. What to fix? You can't run a system that's going to be 100% error free. If the fix is in. It's just oddly ironic that we have an election coming up and that they are stopping us and saying we can't do it. Fox News reporting, stealing your vote. Reporting from New York City, here's Eric Shaw. Former Louisiana Governor Earl Long used to tell a joke. After I die, Long quipped, bury me in Louisiana so I can stay active in politics. A clever line. And at times, you have to chuckle at the length some politicians will go to win an election. But when that happens, it may be you who is being robbed. Your vote canceled out. Fox News has traveled across the country to investigate charges of voter fraud and ask the question, how easy is it, even in this day and age, to steal your vote? Stonington, Connecticut. I was a little surprised because they said this is not possible. What wasn't possible to Jane Gumpel was that her deceased mother, Jane Drury, voted in 2007. But apparently, she did. The town clerk's record clearly shows Miss Drury voted more than seven years after she died. It was an impossible situation to me. It is what most Americans would think of as potential voter fraud, a living person voting in the name of the dead. Election officials blamed clerical errors. But across the country, other forms of fraud have led to stolen votes and prosecutions. Take what happened in Oakland County, Michigan two years ago. The head of the local Democratic Party, Michael McGinnis, and his roommate, Jason Bauer, tried to get several Tea Party candidates on the ballot during the 2010 local elections. Problem was, some candidates had no idea their names were being used. It turns out, Bauer had notarized fake filings for them. This fake Tea Party was designed from the beginning to be deceptive, to confuse voters, to siphon votes from legitimate candidates. You engaged in some political shenanigans that attempted to circumvent democracy. Bauer received probation plus fines. McGinnis received a similar sentence. <laughs> Troy, New York. Did you steal an election or try to steal one? Again, you asked me that before, I told you no. Prosecutors say politicians stole an election by faking absentee ballots. So far, four Democratic public officials and political operatives have pled guilty to the alleged scheme. The idea, to get Democratic candidates also on the ballot of the Working Families Party line in the 2009 primary. The more ballot lines a candidate has to run on, the more votes that candidate will get. It is charged they did this by filling out and submitting fraudulent absentee ballots like this one for voter Jessica Boomhauer. Did you vote? No. But they have your vote at the Board of Elections. They do. Her absentee application falsely claimed she was attending a work conference in Boston. Brian Suazo says his vote was stolen too. Did you fill out an absentee ballot application? No. Nope. His claim Brian was home recovering from a medical procedure. So your vote was a fraud. It was. In January, two officials faced the first trial, Democratic Elections Commissioner Edward McDonough and former Democratic City Councilman Michael Laporta. You did nothing wrong? Absolutely nothing. Okay. What a bank. As far as I know, I know as much as you do. On March 13th, a mistrial was declared, but they will be retried. Two others, including former City Council President Clem Campana, also faced trial. No one tried to steal any election, even though the voters told us that they didn't hand these absentee ballots in. They didn't vote. They said this stuff was phony, I it did. was fake. They were not real votes. I did nothing wrong. But one political operative admitted that the faking of absentee ballots is routine, quote, a normal political tactic. Not just in New York. This 1998 Florida Department of Law Enforcement report calls absentee ballots the, quote, tool of choice for those inclined to commit voter fraud. They should know. That year, the court threw out the results of Miami's 1997 mayoral election, which was nonpartisan, when it was determined that more than 5,000 fraudulent absentee ballots had been cast. We're going to have a nice, orderly hearing. An appeals court named Joe Carollo mayor 
four months after Xavier Suarez had seemingly won. Some academic researchers, the most cited, NYU's Brennan Center for Justice, say voter fraud is rare and an issue that is overblown. But you may get a different take from those who've run for office. How easy is it to steal an election? If you've got someone who's nefarious enough to do it, it's a relatively easy thing to do. Former Alabama Congressman Democrat Arthur Davis told us that while campaigning, he would estimate the number of clean votes he would need to overcome the dirty ones cast against him. He says there are a variety of ways to try and steal an election. You can fake absentee ballots. You can fake uh, the names of dead people and vote in the name of the dead. You can do that, and that certainly happened. So it and sounds like it's pretty easy to do if you know how to do it. If you have an intent to do it, if you are willing to do it, it's a fairly easy thing to do. Case in point, Brooks County, Georgia. An unusually high number of absentee ballots were submitted in the 2010 Democratic primary for the local school board. After they were counted, two candidates, who were losing by a relatively sizable margin to the incumbents, had a reversal of fortune. Linda Troutman and Elizabeth Thomas went on to win the general election. About a month later, they were arrested and charged with allegedly stuffing the ballot box using absentee ballots. Ten others were also arrested in the alleged scheme. Their trial is pending. Tunica County, Mississippi. NAACP official Lesa Dulles Sowers was convicted on 10 counts of fraudulently casting absentee ballots during the 2007 Democratic primary. Her DNA was found on the inner seals of five envelopes containing those ballots. Sowers is currently serving a five-year prison term. Daytona Beach, Florida. During the 2010 primary, city commissioner Derek Henry and his campaign manager Genesis Robinson illegally obtained absentee ballots for 92 people during Henry's re-election campaign. They were caught because a large group of absentee ballot requests were sent online using a single email address. After the arrest, Henry's lawyer claimed he was just trying to help African Americans who didn't have internet access to vote. Instead of being accused of a crime, Derek Henry should be applauded for attempting to help these people to vote. But in January 2011, Henry agreed to a pre-trial intervention program admitting his guilt. He agreed to pay about $23,000 and gave up the four-year term he had won. Robinson pled to a similar deal. By the way, Henry never needed those extra votes, not by a long shot. His 799 votes trounced his two opponents, who each received just over 200. County commission, probate judge, sheriff, the local level is where the power is concentrated. Is that where voter fraud really is widespread? It's where it has more of an impact because who your sheriff is probably matters more than who the governor of the state is to many of these people. Lincoln County, West Virginia. Sheriff, why did you try to steal the election? Sheriff Jerry Bowman was term limited and running for another public office, circuit clerk, in the 2010 primary election. He was looking to unseat incumbent Democrat Charles Brumfield. We were ahead, and then they came out, well, we found some absentee ballots. When the final tally was, we lost. Sheriff Bowman admitted to falsifying more than 100 absentee ballot applications and even voting some ballots himself. In February, he pled guilty to a federal conspiracy charge. And it is not always local offices at stake. Election fraud charges even touch a race for the highest office in the land. Did you sign this petition for Barack mm -hmm. Obama? No. no. St. Joseph County, Indiana. Prosecutors charged Democratic operatives faked petitions to put then-candidates Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton on the 2008 Democratic primary ballot for president. I did not sign for Barack Obama. So someone forged this? That's correct. So many signatures were reportedly forged that President Obama may not have legally qualified for the ballot. Longtime Democratic County Chairman Butch Morgan, who allegedly ordered the scheme, and three election and party officials have been indicted including Dustin Blythe, who worked in the county's Board of Voter Registration and is accused of forging the Obama petitions. Did you fake any petitions at all? I don't have anything to say. All four have pled not guilty. Here's another story from Indiana. In February, the state's top election official, Republican Secretary of State Charlie White, was himself convicted of voter fraud, not for trying to steal the election, but for registering to vote at his ex-wife's house. Coming up, Allegations of fraud in the Wisconsin recall. That after the break.
Purdue, Wisconsin, 2011, Republican Governor Scott Walker picked a fight with the unions and won. Then his opponents started a recall campaign. As soon as the petition started circulating, Walker's allies cried fraud. Were they also crying wolf? November 2011, Wisconsin Democrats' first hurdle, get 540,000 Wisconsin voters to sign a petition saying they want a re-election forced on Walker in 2012. As soon as they started collecting signatures, Walker supporters began raising charges of possible fraud. I imagine they will get a lot of signatures, legal and illegal. In December, the specter of fraud was raised by Governor Walker himself. We had one of the local affiliates here to the story about uh, someone signing it proudly saying they signed 80 different recall petitions. In the report, the Milwaukee man explained, quote, they cheated for Bush, so hey, I'm going to cheat to get Scott Walker out of here. He later said he was joking. This woman, however, seemed serious when she talked with us. I've been in Madison a couple of times. And I have signed petitions there too, I think. So you're saying that you've signed more than one petition? Mm -hmm. That is not illegal unless the serial signer is intentionally trying to defraud the system. But whatever the intent, signing multiple recall petitions can have major consequences. Scott Walker! If anti-Walker forces succeed, it would only be the third recall of a governor in U.S. history. But what if anti-Walker forces reach their goal with phony or duplicate signatures? That would be stealing an election, says Brian Sikma of Media Trackers, a conservative watchdog group in Wisconsin. The legitimacy of this election hinges on whether or not the election takes place because of a fraudulent recall process. Democrats fill recall petitions with hundreds of thousands of signatures. But are they legit? It seems election officials, who have never seen a recall effort on this scale, have no effective mechanism to root out ineligible signatures. It is the state government accountability board's job to check the names. But it says it will not actually strike duplicate names or even obviously fake ones. And we may certainly note fictitious names if we note them on the petition, we'll, we'll flag them, um, but we will not strike them. It will be up to Walker and his volunteers to prove which signatures are bogus. January 17th, the Democrats deliver boxes containing more than 900,000 signatures, almost twice as many needed to trigger the governor's recall. Today we are making history. Thank you. We did it. <laughs> the state board was granted 60 days to examine more than 150,000 pages. But board director Kevin Kennedy reiterates his office will not be crossing off fraudulent signatures. The fraud issues get raised through the challenge process primarily. That rests with the office holders. In other words, the Walker camp. Republican Party Vice Chair Brian Schimming. There is a reason for concern. We've seen an uptick in uh, voter fraud here in Wisconsin in the last several years. They only have 30 days to try and strike more than 400,000 signatures. Someone signing for someone else on this form, and of course that would be committing fraud. It seems evident to me that the circulator of the petition has filled in some of the information. We just want to make sure that Wisconsin voters are not people that are being disenfranchised uh, by people signing their names. That is a serious concern. But can unproven allegations of fraud also undermine the credibility of elections? New Mexico, 2011. Republican Secretary of State Diana Duran launched an investigation into potential voting by non-citizens. Her staff cross-checked 1.16 million voter registrations against motor vehicle and Social Security databases. Her findings? Less than shocking. Over several election cycles, only 19 votes even appeared to be cast by non-citizens. Not exactly the culture of corruption she had alleged. Duran had a hard time explaining that to state lawmakers. Do we have any actual evidence of voter fraud that is taking place? The answer to that question, it's, it's a difficult one to answer at times. It's hard for people to just say, say yes or no, there's voter fraud. Back in Wisconsin, the Walker camp is having a hard time uncovering rampant fraud too. Any reasonable uh, person looking at this understands there's going to be a recall election. In late February, they relent, sort of. They say they simply do not have enough time to go through all the petitions, 
yet they don't back off the fraud claims. Democrats scoffed on the state party website, saying, quote, the real fraud here has been Scott Walker. Whatever the case, Republicans and Democrats have redirected their energies away from gathering and challenging signatures to drumming up votes for the June 5th recall election. Still, the distrust felt on both sides surely will not bolster confidence in the final outcome. When we return, he could not tell a lie. But did George Washington buy votes? Election chicanery older than the USA after the break. New allegations of election fraud are popping up almost every week. But there's nothing new about shenanigans at the polls. It's an American tradition older than the nation itself. George Washington, the father of our country, the man who could not tell a lie, a politician who bribed voters with booze. Yes, Washington himself was not above trying to steal an election back in 1758 when he ran for a seat in the Virginia House of Burgesses. He was too busy being a colonel in the army and not busy enough getting out the vote. Allison Hayward is the vice president of policy at the Center for Competitive Politics and an election policy historian. It's kind of shocking to realize that he went out and treated voters, that is, compensated them with ale and mead and beer for voting. No wonder when you look at his receipts. He bought 158 gallons of booze, which amounts to a quart and a half of liquor per voter. But it was just an inkling of what was to come. For as our nation grew, so did the political machines. One machine that became synonymous with corruption was Tammany Hall, which by the mid-1800s dominated New York City politics. They would um, pay people to vote, pay other people not to vote, pay people who counted the votes. You name it, they did it. Tammany Hall's best-known leader was William Boss Tweed, who said, quote, I don't think there was ever a fair or honest election in the city of New York. But corruption and fraud wasn't limited to local elections. It was found at even the highest levels. For instance, there was perhaps the most hotly contested presidential election ever. It came down to the state of Florida. Amidst cries of rampant fraud, a small panel decided by one vote to award the presidency to the Republican who had not won the popular vote. Bush versus Gore in 2000? No. Rutherford B. Hayes versus Samuel J. Tilden in 1876. This was done by all the you know, tools of the trade, um, throwing out Tilden ballots until you had enough Hayes ballots, intimidating you know, local officials. With the number of contested electoral votes in the South, Congress set up a commission to decide the presidency. Along party lines, it named Hayes the winner. So basically you're saying, in that race, the Republicans stole a presidential election. Rutherford Hayes is forever known as Rutherford. As we moved into the 20th century, corruption was still rampant. In Atlantic City, Enoch Nucky Johnson engaged in hanky-panky, and Bob Pendergast ruled Kansas City in the 1920s and 30s. One of his protégés was Harry S. Truman, who became known as the senator from Pendergast. He was an honest man, but he was their candidate. Richard Brookheiser is a noted journalist and historian. He's their clean guy, so they want to keep him clean, keep him over there, and then they'll be, um, you know, performing their black arts on the side. Another national political figure of the 20th century had closer ties to stolen election claims. Lyndon Johnson had a nickname Landslide Lyndon because his first successful run for the Senate was by a very tiny margin. And the question has always been, uh, how many votes were stolen. Johnson rose to Senate Majority Leader and then became John F. Kennedy's running mate in 1960. Lyndon Baines Johnson. Another presidential election tainted by questionable voting. It started in the West Virginia primary where Kennedy was running against Hubert Humphrey. Kennedy was just a younger, fresher, uh, more energetic candidate. But um, Kennedy's father, uh, Joe Kennedy, uh, didn't want to count on that so money was spread around in West Virginia. Kennedy joked that his father advised him, quote, don't buy a single vote more than is necessary. I'll be damned if I'm going to pay for a landslide. In a close general election, Kennedy defeated Richard Nixon, who Democrats had long nicknamed Tricky Dick. But some say JFK seemed to be the one with something up his sleeve. The word went out that Illinois needed to go to Kennedy. So ballots were manufactured, other ballots, Disappeared. Do you think that President Kennedy stole the election? 
many people who have gone back and looked at the evidence have said yes. Some Republican leaders thought Nixon should challenge the results, but he believed contesting the election would damage an already divided nation. My uh, congratulations to Senator Kennedy for his fine race in this campaign. Forty years later, another two-term vice president finished second in a close race, but he did not go away so quietly. It was 2000, Bush versus Gore. What looked like a late-night narrow-margin victory for Bush ended up with Gore retracting his concession. A month of recounts, hundreds of lawyers descending on Florida, charges and countercharges of bad ballots, voter fraud, intimidation, and suppression, multiple legal cases in state and federal courts, and a Supreme Court ruling that effectively ended the election. People are still grumbling about that election, and it got the George W. Bush presidency off on the wrong foot. And in a way, it just it never recovered from that. Nobody ever likes to lose. But if you feel you've been cheated, that's much worse. Coming up, the acorn that grew into a massive scandal. Voter registration fraud. You know, few groups were more associated with that than ACORN. Its voter registration drives were the stuff of legend in more ways than one. You can register again and again and again if you already registered before. In 2008, the Association of Community Organizations for Reform Now, or ACORN, made national headlines for allegations of filing countless voter registrations with fraudulent names. How many times did you sign up? Like 73 times. How many? 73 times. Freddie 70. Johnson of Ohio signed up by ACORN. That was, that was, I thought that I could help other people. Mickey Mouse appeared on an application in Florida. Dallas Cowboys quarterback Tony Romo on one in Nevada. Hundreds of thousands of registrations were rejected by elections officials across the country. Criminal cases were filed in 15 states. Some 50 people were arrested in connection with ACORN-related voter registration fraud. At least 30 pled guilty. In Las Vegas, ACORN itself pled guilty to felony compensation for registration of voters. It is making a mark of our election process. The scandals helped kill the organization. Voter registration officials hated ACORN. I mean, they hated ACORN because they felt the group was conducting illegal activities with all these fake names. It's too bad they were never able to prove any of that. Wade Rathke is the founder of ACORN. Rathke ran the organization for 38 years, starting in 1970, and claims it got a bad rap for its voter registration drives. You're talking to me about things after I left in 2008, but I think by law, in virtually every place, we're required to turn in everything. So, Eric, if you gave me your voter registration form and you said Mickey Mouse, I, I kind of know you don't live in Orlando, but by obligation, we have to turn that in. Do you think ACORN wasn't fairly blamed? Totally not fairly blamed. But what do we do about all those uh, faked voter registration names? I mean, thousands of them on these forms that were handed in by ACORN. Well, they only really are a huge problem if somebody tried to vote with a fake form. But we don't know if someone did. Well, we're pretty sure that they didn't. Rathke claims politicians who complain about voter registration fraud really have a different agenda, to keep eligible voters away from the polls. Barack Obama voiced that concern during the 2008 campaign. What I want to make sure of, though, is that this is not used as an excuse for the kind of uh, voter suppression strategies and tactics that we've seen in the past. When he got to the White House, President Obama's Justice Department turned that concern into a crusade, a crusade against voter ID. Next, voter ID laws, the push for them and the push back. And later, I like y'all, Franken. They're all felons. They all voted illegally. Would we have Obamacare if they hadn't? Our investigation continues after the break. The Civil War ended slavery, but powerful whites still made it hard for black people to vote. The Civil Rights Movement helped change that. But we're again hearing charges of voter suppression, and it's leveled at people who favor voter IDs. Let everybody hear how excited we are to be at this Bill Sonic. On May 18, 2011, Nikki Haley put her signature on a bill in a ceremony laden with history and symbolism. She, after all, was the first woman and first minority elected governor of South Carolina, a state with a sad history of keeping blacks from voting and whites in power. 
and the new law would require every South Carolinian to show a picture ID before entering the voting booth. That law, as you'll see, has sparked ugly charges that Haley is conspiring with those old forces of bigotry to steal elections in her state. But Haley, whose parents emigrated from India, thinks South Carolina's real problem today is that votes of law-abiding citizens are being canceled out by illegally cast ballots. This protects the elderly. This protects people who may do their absentee ballots. This protects everybody. We want to make sure that we're just saying that they are who they say they are. Without photo ID, what do you fear could happen? Well, without photo ID, I mean, let's be clear, I don't want dead people voting in the state of South Carolina. And authorities say there is evidence that dead people voting is a real problem, according to a statewide investigation by South Carolina's Department of Motor Vehicles. In January, it found that 953 ballots were cast by voters who were deceased, though the State Elections Commission director disputes those findings. The report came out after Haley signed the voter ID law, but hasn't stopped the criticism of it. Were you surprised at the reaction that you got from this? Very surprised. Protecting the integrity of the voting process is one of the most important things we can do as a governor in a state. And 13 other states have passed photo ID laws like South Carolina's including Indiana's, whose voter ID law was ruled constitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court in 2008. For all these reasons, Governor Haley says she was stunned when President Obama's Attorney General, Eric Holder, quickly blocked her from enforcing the law. Holder acted under the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which gives the Department of Justice extraordinary power in states with histories of voter suppression. Honoring our democracy demands that we remove any and all barriers to voting. Holder declined our repeated request for an interview, but he's made his views clear elsewhere. <laughs> to stop Texas's voter ID laws, for instance, the Justice Department claims there is significant evidence that the Texas state legislature actually intended to suppress minority votes. Hillary Shelton, the NAACP's senior vice president for advocacy, says Holder is right. Jim Crow is dead and buried, but James E. Crow Esquire is alive and well more insidious and trickier than ever before. Jim Crow was the era of institutionalized segregation from Reconstruction to the mid-1960s, in which many Southern states prevented blacks from voting using everything from poll taxes and literacy tests to even murders and lynchings. And of course, nearly 50 years later, America now has a black president. Shelton charges that supporters of voter ID laws want to turn back the clock the only way they can win elections is if they suppress votes altogether. That's un-American. That's undemocratic. And voter ID laws are not the only tactic Shelton points to. <laughs> Take the 2010 Maryland governor's race, in which GOP Governor Robert Ehrlich faced off against Democratic challenger Martin O'Malley. Republicans sent out this robocall to more than 100,000 voters, predominantly African Americans. I'm calling to let everyone know that Governor O'Malley and President Obama have been successful. Our goals have been met. Prosecutors say the goal was to convince anyone who answered that there was no need to go to the polls, which were still open. We're okay. Relax. Everything is fine. The only thing left is to watch it on TV tonight. It didn't work. The Republican Ehrlich lost, and his campaign aide, Paul Shurek, was later arrested. A jury found him guilty of four counts of voter fraud. In addition to a violation of the law, and, and more importantly to me, it was, in fact, a profound personal failure. I have paid and will continue to pay a price for that failure. According to the NAACP, the new wave of voter ID laws are voter suppression of a much higher order. In fact, the organization filed a complaint in Geneva with the United Nations Human Rights Council, a body that includes China, Cuba, and Saudi Arabia, calling the laws the, quote, most vicious, coordinated, and sinister attack to narrow participation in our democracy since the early 20th century. We've been going at this again for 103 years. It's trickery, it's a sleight of hand, and we're utilizing the UN as a tool. You talk about Jim Crow. Is voter ID similar? Absolutely. Even to murder, even to lynchings? It's the same thing in many ways. Now look, we can argue that it's not as violent, it's not as bloody. Bottom line is, what kind of effect does it have? I was in Alabama not too long ago in Birmingham. I met a guy that was about 75 years old. It took him four days in Alabama to get that free photo ID. We know that people are going to be turned off and forego voting at all. But former Alabama Democratic Congressman Arthur Davis doesn't buy it. I never heard a single voter 
in my 68% African American district complained to me about ID being something that was onerous or burdensome or difficult. You never had any voter ever say, I don't have an ID, I couldn't vote. Not a single one. The idea that people in low-income African-American communities are bothered or intimidated or burdened by attaching just a few responsibilities to their all-important core right of voting, uh, it's a condescending idea, it's a patronizing idea. If a law works the same with respect to everybody, it's free and clear of whatever history of bigotry or racial animus exists in a state like South Carolina. When they're saying we're denying people, I would ask them the other side. Tell me who has been denied. I said anybody that can't get to the Department of Motor Vehicles to get a picture ID, we will take you there. And how many South Carolinians without an ID called for a lift? After three weeks, 23 rides. Out of what, five million? Out of five million people in our state. That's all we got. We said, fine, we will give them a ride. 23. Do you think the administration has been trying to gin this up for political purposes? And it's just oddly ironic that we have an election coming up. And it's oddly ironic that we're trying to get this passed before that election and that they are stopping us and saying we can't do it. Charges of voting rights hypocrisy are not new to the Obama Justice Department. Do you swear or affirm on Christopher Coates was the DOJ's voting rights section chief when Holder first took office. I'm here today to testify about the Department of Justice's final disposition of the new Black Panther Party case. The new Black Panther Party case was sparked by this 2008 video. It shows members outside a Philadelphia polling place. The one with the billy club reportedly called voters white devils and told them, quote, you're about to be ruled by the black man, cracker. The Bush Justice Department charged the new Black Panther Party and three of its members with voter intimidation. But after Holder became Attorney General, the Department of Justice dismissed the charges against the party and two of its members, but did obtain an injunction against the one holding the club. Holder vehemently denied race had any role in the decision, and an internal department report found no evidence of political interference. But an outrage Coates testified that Obama Justice Department officials took the position that the voting rights laws did not protect whites, only minorities. White voters also have an interest in being able to go to the polls without having race haters standing at the entrance of a polling place with a billy club in his hand hurling racial slurs at voters. Coates no longer works at Justice. He's in private practice. One of his clients, the state of South Carolina. It recently hired him to defend the state against his old boss. You're talking to a minority female governor of the state of South Carolina. There is nothing I want more than to make sure everybody that wants to vote can. Coming up, did illegal votes by felons give Democrats what they needed to ultimately make the Obama agenda law? An eye-opening investigation after the break. Many of the cases we've told you about involve local races, where it doesn't take many votes to steal an election. It's usually a different story on the state or national level. But as you're about to see, if illegal votes do decide one of those elections, the stakes for all of us are huge. Did illegal ballots cast by people like these, convicted felons who'd lost their voting rights, decide an election that changed America? Do you think that your vote helped Al Franken get into office? I don't know, but I, would, I hope it did. The story begins the morning after the 2008 election. Minnesota's Republican Senator Norm Coleman thought he defeated his Democratic opponent, comedian Al Franken, and won a second term by 725 votes. Where we are today uh, is uh, me being humbled and grateful for the victory that the voters gave us last night. That was great news for Republicans. Barack Obama had defeated John McCain for the White House, but a Coleman victory over Al Franken would deny the new president a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate and free reign to enact his agenda. But Coleman's tiny margin of victory triggered an automatic recount. It also alarmed Dan McGrath. He's the executive director of the Minnesota Majority, a conservative government watchdog group. Do you think there was voter fraud in the 2008 Senate race? I don't think there was voter fraud. I know there was voter fraud. And so, while the official eight-month politically charged recount battle unfolded, the Minnesota majority ran its own investigation. 
McGrath thought he found a smoking gun. Convicted felons who were still on paper, still serving probation, ineligible to vote under Minnesota's Constitution, voted in large numbers in the 2008 election. How did McGrath reach that conclusion? The Minnesota majority compared two computer databases. The first listed people who had voted in the election. The second, people charged with felonies. That search turned up hundreds of names. The Minnesota majority suspected were felons who had voted illegally. But by then, the state Supreme Court had already declared Franken the winner by a razor-thin margin of 312 votes. But the story wasn't over for Dan McGrath with his long list of people he suspected of voting illegally. You had all this evidence, you <clears> gathered <throat> it together, and then who did you go to? We brought it to the county attorneys. And under Minnesota law, the county attorney, upon receiving an uh, affidavit alleging voter fraud, is compelled to investigate and upon finding probable cause to prosecute. What happened next is one of the most extensive crackdowns on voter fraud in recent American history. Statewide, the best available evidence indicates there have been roughly 175 convictions of felons voting illegally, and another 60-plus cases are pending. You'd think Dan McGrath would be pleased. He's not. The number of felons being convicted is not the number of felons that actually voted while they weren't supposed to. It's much higher than that. How many felons did you find voted in that election? Uh, according to our research, a 1,000 felons participated in the election while they were ineligible to vote. If that number is right, that's triple Franken's 312 vote margin of victory. This much is true. The actual number of felons who illegally voted is larger than the number of convictions because you have to intend to vote illegally to be guilty. Rick Hogston is the assistant prosecutor in charge of voter fraud for the Washington County Attorney's Office. He convicted 16 people based in part on McGrath's list. Is it possible for a felon to vote illegally, admit it, confess to it, and yet because he didn't, quote, intend to do that, they can get away with it? Yes, it is. That's why some of our counties in Minnesota received hundreds of referrals and yet have prosecuted a relatively small number of cases. To McGrath, that's hundreds of votes that should not have been counted. If they weren't in the mix, what potentially could have happened? Potentially the election could have gone to Norm Coleman. So Al Franken, in your view, benefited from these illegal felon votes? It looks likely. From the research that we've seen on the voting proclivity of uh, convicted felons, it appears that it was likely to benefit Al Franken. The race was 312 votes between Franken and Coleman. Do you think felons voting illegally could have tipped that election. I have no way of knowing who the felons that voted unlawfully voted for. Sue Gertner was the Ramsey County attorney and in fact convicted 27 felons for voting illegally. I am highly skeptical that felons voted for one candidate or another en masse. Working off a list of those convicted of voter fraud, we went door to door. Did you vote for Franken? Yes, I voted for him too. Obama and Franken? Al Franken. Franken. Al Franken. We talked to 10 of the felons convicted of voting illegally. Nine of them said they voted for Franken. It wasn't a scientific sample, but it is consistent with academic studies that found felons overwhelmingly vote Democratic. Of course, in an election so close, other factors could have tilted it one way or the other. So we wondered what the candidates in that momentous 2008 election think about this. Senator Franken declined our request for an interview. Former Senator Coleman did not. Felons voted illegally in heavily Democratic counties. That could have turned the election. If we dealt with the issue of, of felons voting, it could have turned the election. Uh, but in the end, it, it is what it is. And I really don't spend time fretting. Though Coleman is philosophical, he still acknowledges the staggering difference a handful of votes could have made for all Americans. Obamacare doesn't pass if the result of the Minnesota election is different. $850 billion stimulus package cast on a partisan vote doesn't pass if the Minnesota race is different. He also recognizes another consequence of fraud, that it can shake citizens' faith in the system. Voter fraud has happened uh, in the past, and I presume it will happen in the future. But democracy uh, flourishes because of citizens' confidence in those who represent them. I mean, if, you, if you undermine that confidence, and it really hurts the democratic process. Many of the most corrupt dictatorships in history have held elections. Amazingly, they always win, and almost nobody is fooled. In America, even when our system doesn't run perfectly, the overwhelming majority of voters remain confident their ballots do count. 
they should feel that way. But election fraud can only undermine the belief that our leaders act with the consent of the governed. Only vigilance and prudence ensure that it doesn't. I'm Eric Sean. That's our show. Thanks for watching.